Jones of America, and live from the GND Show Studio, this is your Ghost Man and Demon Hunter Show. Doesn't that sound exciting to you? Welcome back, Shadow Nation, to the one, the only, Mystifying Oracle of Radio, your Ghost Man and Demon Hunter show. Huh? That's right, hey, I, I'm, I'm getting a little bit of fuzz there, I lost you for a second, Sean, but we're back, we're bad, we're having our typical uh, sound problems, which makes us mad, but hey, <laughs> we're we're on the air. Hey! To la rula rula, we made it back again. Happy St. Patty's Day for tomorrow, guys. That's right, Sean. You must be really uh, enjoying what you consider to be your holiday. It, yeah, it is kind of my holiday. But, you know, since I'm not 100% Irish, I, I get to celebrate several, several holidays, Demon Hunter. That's well, the way to do else, it. What else uh, are you besides Irish? I am American, first off. A proud American, but, uh, you know, I, apparently my ancestors shook it up a bit. So you have Ireland, you have Cherokee engine, you have, uh, I'm not supposed to say engine, right? It's not politically correct. <laughs> Cherokee Indian. If, if it's in your blood, I guess you're allowed to say it. It's uh, you, you, So you have a little Cherokee engine in you there? Do you want some? <laughs> I, I was going to say, what was his name and how much did he leave last time? <laughs> I'm proud of you. The whole world's proud of you, Demon Hunter, like, uh, like always. But uh, hey guys, welcome back. Sunday night, best time of the night. For you, Shadow Nation, the GND show fans, uh, eight years and still kicking. That, that's uh, this would mark the eighth St. Patty's Day on the air, right, Demon? Uh, that would be correct, sir. This would be our eighth. Yeah, because 2007 was our first St. Patty's Day. Um, so yes, eight year, eight different years of getting drunk on the air on St. Patty's Day. I would say the only thing that's changed is the less beer intake during the show since then <laughs> yeah there was a bit more intake of the beer during the show uh i do which re- is why we invented the gnd drinking game so yes. that we could keep drinking during the show well yeah we wanted to make sure that the uh, our listeners the shadow nation didn't get upset that we got blitzed on the air so <laughs> we wanted you guys to join us and you know it, it I, in that time we've become the We've gone from one of the most popular paranormal radio shows on the air to one of the most not quite paranormal radio shows on yeah, the air, but still popular. But still popular. It's uh, but uh, it, it's true, Sean. I mean, you, we we should have been out looking for leprechauns this week. We should have, laddie. Is that what you say, laddie? Laddie. I, I would so. hope you'd call me a laddie because if you called me a lassie, there'd be something wrong with you. Lassie, come home. What is a laddie? Is it, it's a small child? Or? A laddie's a, a young boy. A lassie's a young girl. Okay, a lass and a, and a lassie. It was the big joke because lassie was played by a male dog on the show, but right. they kept calling it lassie. He'd say, come here, girl. And it was funny. People laughed. He, he, he. They did. Well, back in the day, you know, I mean, it was uh, a dog was a dog. Right, right. A dog was a dog. Of course, of course. And a horse was a horse, of course, of course, Demon Hunter. <laughs> you didn't see that coming, did you? Little kids watching saying, you know, Daddy, why does Lassie have something hanging down between her knees? Right. Well, I can tell the Shadow Nation uh, is happy to have us back. I can smell the beer through the microphone. I can, <laughs> I can hear the people out there. That's just the beer on your microphone. Didn't uh, somebody sing a song about that one? That's true. Yeah. I don't know who that was. Just some no-name, I some think. Some guy. Yeah. Some no-name. Likes to sing. <laughs> Yeah, Billy Joe, I think, was the one that... Uh, anyway, guys, like I was saying, I said that twice before, but it is Sunday night, the best time of the week. And, uh, you know, we apologize because uh, the last two weekends... I, I seen uh, Nathan had posted something last weekend, and we had the show all ready to go, the guest booked, which is uh, very rare. And uh, we were prepared and everything, and then I got a call where I had to fly out to uh, good old Dallas, Texas, and uh, and do some work. But the week before that, Demon Hunter. Yes. The weekend before that, the reason we didn't have any shows. So what's it, have we been off the air for three weeks? Three uh, confirmed three weeks. weeks. 
I've, I've been jonesing for a show for three weeks, Sean. Three weeks. Well, the little hula girl shaking her... Her sick in her booty on my desk, Demon Hunter, next to the G and D show bell. We got a G and D show hula girl now. Um, I picked her up in the El Carib. The Air El Carib. The El Carib. The Caribbean band. The Big Blue. The Big Blue Water. I went on a cruise. Big shout out to Carnival Cruise Lines. I got to tell you, Freedom of the Sea was the name of the ship, and oh my God, man! Being, have you ever been on a cruise, Demon Hunter? I have never been on a cruise. We had a, well, I guess an oceanfront view, <laughs> right? I, I guess. hope so. Well, they have outside, uh, I, I did find this out. I found some things out about the cruise. First off, it's like the Titanic times 20 inside there. Hardwood floors and stuff in the dining hall. Big wraparound stairs. All that's true, folks. And uh, I'm sure they're not all the same, but uh, we had, you have... Exterior and interior rooms. Of course, the interior rooms without the balcony over the ocean cost less, but we went ahead and sprung for an exterior room. And I got to tell you something, Demon Hunter. At night, being on that deck, setting out there in the middle of a black ocean and hearing the boat hit those waves, it's kind of intimidating. It's spooky, man. At any time, Poseidon, god of the sea, might hop up out onto the deck and say, Are you Sean Burris? I've been looking for you. Well, you know, you think about the stories that people have, uh, you know, they get lost out to sea and stuff, and it would not be that hard. Now, today, of course, it probably would, but, uh, well, not really. They had that story where the guy was floating on a raft for like a year or something. Floating on a raft for a year? Yeah, well, it was that dude. Didn't you remember it in the, uh, you know, in that in the news? It was all over the place. Guy said he had to eat his friend or something. It was just a month ago or whatever. I only read news about zombies. But if he was eating people, that might fit in. I'll have to look that one up. We'll see. Yeah. I would, uh, I'd have to eat you if we were on a raft stuck at least two days. I, you would survive for two days. <laughs> I'm a big guy. I can't go without, you know. Got to eat. You'd be like a hot pocket. I'd have to I'd have to finish you off with some fish or something. We'd have to scuba dive. What would we do, though? I was thinking the whole time, what would happen if I fell overboard? We were like three decks up. I'd probably die as soon as I hit the water, but I I was thinking... Well, I'd be falling asleep on the side of the boat. All of a sudden, I'd hear... There can be only one. <laughs> there can be only... It'd be you saying it, so of course. <laughs> there can be only one. No, but, uh, you know, we had the... Uh, I was out there in the big black ocean, and I kept thinking, what happened? Because they don't have rails up. I mean, they do. They have, like, waist tie. But I am sure somewhere in the history of cruises, some idiots bought a ticket and went overboard there in the ocean. But I would think, wouldn't you think the boat would pull you under? Well, I would think so. Yeah. It's uh, well, it's like those stories they had several years ago about uh, that movie came out where the people went out scuba diving and they went to they came back up to the surface and the boat had left without them. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that was open water. And apparently that happens every year. People get left behind while scuba diving. I never heard that. It's just swimming with bow-legged women. Thank you, Quint. <laughs> yeah, I was watching that the other day. It actually came on while I was on the cruise ship. We had like four channels. And the funny BBC thing one, is... BBC Two. And the funny thing is, when you go through uh, the Caribbean, and you go past Honduras and all these other places that uh, not... You know, they're not in the uh, El Carib or whatever, but when you go past these different places and the language on the TV will change. So I one night, so. I, yeah, one night I was watching The Matrix and it was perfect. You know, it was English and everything. The next night I turned it on, it was The Matrix going, hey, 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 hey. <laughs> and I'm going, well, thank God I've seen it 20 times. I could just fill in the blade. They only got like four channels, man. You know, and for night shift people like us, I got to have television. Yeah, it is tough for me to fall asleep without a TV at this point. Yeah, I gotta have well because you're all screwed up now. I mean, well, <laughs> a TV and sleeping pills pretty much is. Uh, yeah. Well, when you when you like spend your whole life in dark places with demons chasing you, you know you get used to uh, staying awake in the dark. Demons are coming for you. See, <laughs> I was, I was, but anyway, the cruise we went to Coco Cay, which is a. Um, a secluded island in the Bahamas, and then uh, that was kind of that was kind of different because you only get to stay like six hours on the beach, crystal clear water, white sand, and we. I mean, I laid out there and baked for a while. I got in the water. It was kind of cool, cool this time of year, uh, but I did get in the water. And then we went to a place called Saint Thomas Demon Hunter. Sean got into the water, into the cold water. His wife looked down. I thought it'd be bigger. <laughs> she says that anyway. <laughs> she does. I'm not making it up, you know. But 
Hot dog. Thanks, Greg. But anyway, they got... Um, anyway, I went on from St. Thomas to St. Martin. But Demon Hunter, what inspired tonight's show was... Uh, well, we had to have a show. But the other thing that inspired it is when I was out there, I went to St. Thomas. Beautiful on the outside. When I went inside to scuba dive. Uh, it was not so good. I mean, it is part of the U.S. Uh, the United States does own St. Thomas. A lot of richy yachts and stuff. I thought, I thought St. Thomas was a uh, territory. Uh, maybe it is. But it flies the United States flag, my friend. And uh, it is owned by the United States, the U.S. Uh, You're going to have, like, everybody in St. Thomas go, we're not owned by anybody. Yeah, they are <laughs> owned. Yes, they are owned. But anyway, um, I went there. And that night when we're going out, um, all the – you've seen the pictures on my Facebook. The whole island is lit up with – Facebook page? Yeah. Check that out. Yeah, check it out. But the, the whole island's lit up with uh, lights and stuff. And, and, and it remind me of that scene from – Pirates of the Caribbean, uh, the second one, where uh, they were coming back after Sparrow died, and they all were holding the candles out in the water. Remember that? Oh, where they, uh... yeah, I, I don't know where the, exactly that was supposed to be, but it was definitely Caribbean, yeah. Yeah, it was somewhere in there, but it reminded me of that because of the lights, and uh, it was really cool. But on very oh, the top light. of the mountain, on the very top of the island, I'm sorry. It, it looks like a mountain, you know, because it goes up really high. And, and on the very top, there's a little black figure you can see, and it's kind of it's just a stone structure, and it's called Blackbeard's Castle. Blackbeard's Castle. I've heard of that guy. Yes, yes, very ruthless pirate that sailed the uh, sailed the seas, the oceans back in the 1700s, late 1700s, I believe, mid to late. But uh, apparently, he had a castle there where uh, you know he would look for incoming ships uh, to plunder. And uh, they also had beautiful women there. And I had heard they call them pirate women. And I was pirate laughing. Women? Yeah, pirate women. And I was laughing about it. And the guy said, no, no, these are pirate women. They're actually islanders. When the pirates would go out and plunder and stuff like that, they would bring women back from Portugal or Spain or, or uh, you know, wherever they went. And they would drop these women on the island. Keep them around for their big booty. They'd keep them around for the big ah, for the big booty. Ah, uh, yeah. And they'd keep them around and make babies, and uh, that's where the island people come from. That's where they got their crews. Some of them. <laughs> Some of them did that. But there's a lot of stuff been going. Anyway, the cruise was awesome, and uh, we went on to St. Martin after that. St. Martin is gorgeous, gorgeous, and I think that's British owned, British. And there was some Dutch there. It had a big, uh, big statue uh, of. God, Peg Leg Pete. Peg Leg Pete. It's the only place in the world I think you can go. In the center of town square is a huge statue of Peg Leg Pete. He was a Dutch pirate, or I'm sorry, a Dutch explorer. And he came back to try to uh, win back St. Martin. It belonged to the Dutch. He tried to win it back from the um, Spanish and ended up getting his leg blown off. So he had the, uh, the wooden leg. Peg Leg Pete. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Yeah, so it was very cool. But, uh, you know, I, I, I found myself, I've always been interested in pirates, you know? Are you a pirate, Sean? We are. So, uh, we, I kind of consider us pirates of the radio. We dare to go where no one else goes. You know, we try to do things differently. That's what pirates do. Of course, they raped and pillaged. We don't do that. Not anymore. They made a stop. Yeah, it doesn't pay anymore. <laughs> Crime don't pay, baby. There's no money in it. But anyway, St. Patty's Day is coming up, Demon Her. St. Patty's Day. Tonight I am drinking Smithwick's Irish Ale to mm. celebrate, Sean. And I have a Goose Island Ten Hills Pale L in my hand from Chicago, of course. Goose Island. Goose Island? The beer of choice tonight. <laughs> you got to have a beer for St. Patty's Day. Got to do it. You got to have beer. You got to have uh, corned beef and cabbage. I didn't have corned beef and cabbage. On the side. I can't handle that in the studio. It's too too enclosed in here. Yeah, that, that's one of the reasons you and I don't share a studio anymore. I just think, uh, you know, St. Patty's Day should be a day that should uh, be able to get adjusted. Kind of like Halloween. You know, if it's on a Monday or something, it, it, they should, you know, they should erase it and put it on a Saturday or Sunday. <laughs> it's a drinking holiday, man. Well, yeah, this is true. And uh, But th think of all the people who take off work on St. Patty's Day because they want to be able to go. When they're done at the, the parade in New York, they want to be able to head over to McLean Avenue and uh, take over the bars. And, of course, then they got to be back to work the next day. So, What's McLean Avenue? 
Uh, M- McLean Avenue. I used to stay there uh, when I was staying in Yonkers, New yeah, York. Yeah. It's a, it's the dividing line between the Bronx and Yonkers, okay. and it's a very Irish neighborhood. And on St. Paddy's Day, let me tell you, there it's just a row of bars, and on either side, uh, there's nothing but uh, there's nothing but bars. And on St. Paddy's Day, every one of them's full. I don't think well, I can. Duty cops there on the weekend. <laughs> Safest place to be as long as you're not drink, uh, drinking and driving. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, you know, that's the thing. A lot of those people can just walk to their house, stumble to their house, <laughs> fall so, down. I don't think I can hang with those guys anymore. You know? Me either. I mean, I remember days when I was younger, a good St. Paddy's Day meant I was crawling home. And uh, I just don't think I could pull that off and go to work the next day. It hurts too much, baby. It hurts too much. <laughs> Anyway, I have Demon- trouble going to work the day after the Ghost Man and Demon Hunter show. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> hey, uh, just a reminder, guys. Uh, Susan G. Komen three-day race for the cure. Uh, Demon Hunter and myself are supporters. That's the Susan G. Komen three-day race for the cure. Uh, we have two friends, Sandy Merritt and Elizabeth... Noel that are running in that. They're cancer fighters, and so are we, guys. Go to our website at ghostanddemon.com and make sure that you donate today. Help us out. Help us fight cancer. Do it today. That's right, folks. And hey, Sean, I also want to give a shout out to probably our number one fan yeah. uh, out there celebrating her birthday tonight. She's not oh. listening because she's out having dinner for, for her birthday, and that would be Nitro Jill. Happy birthday, Jill. Happy birthday, Jill. Or at least she's the number one fan that contacts us all the time. She's the one that uh, contacts us every week and lets us know she's listening, and we appreciate that, Jill. We really do. We do. We do. We love it. Tells us we're doing a great job and keep it up. Don't stop, because if you do, Sean's going to take a bath with his toaster. That's uh, true. (laughs) Hey, tonight's band, Demon Hunter, Shadow Nation, the Bomb Blasters. Uh, Thanks to creativecommons.org. We get our music off there. We still take the music, right, Demon Hunter? We still take uh, intros from people. We still take uh, submissions for music, without a doubt. If you want to submit your music, please send it to us. We uh, we, we just haven't had a lot of uh, music submissions lately, and with uh, Creative Commons out there, it gives us an opportunity to find some bands, put that information out there so that uh, all our fans can listen. And uh, remember, folks, we do get our information thanks to the... Uh, the contracts are available through creativecommons.org and uh, the wonderful people over at freemusicarchive.org. So, uh, tonight's music, Sean. The Bomb Blasters. Don't ask me the name of the song. I'll tell you at the break. But it was a great song by The Bomb Blasters. Check them out, guys. Facebook. I think they have a, uh, well, they at least have a uh, page somewhere. So, just put their name in there. The Bomb Blasters. Yes, yes. You go into uh, freemusicarchive.org. And uh, just search the, search the bomb blasters, and you'll find them. Absolutely. Yay. Yay, we got the, hey, we're paying bills early, man. <laughs> but anyway. Getting it out there. Yeah. Getting it ready. Getting it, hey, I bought a bike this week. I heard that. I seen it, actually. Bought a new motorcycle. Decided I couldn't be taking chances out there on that little bitty Yamaha that I had, the 1985. I was going on too long a trips. Um, so I went out and bought a brand, well, not a brand new, it's used, but a 2007 Honda VTX 1300. And it's like the difference between driving a, a little Fiat and then moving over to a box truck. It's, uh, really? it's huge. Oh, wow. It, I used to take turns on that little Yamaha and I just hit, hit a corner lean into it, throttle up, and just shoot right through the corner. Now if I see a corner coming, i got to start planning a good 20 seconds in advance so I can kind of weave my way over and take the turn into it. But uh, definitely, it's going to take me a little time to get used to, but once I do, it's going to be a heck of a bike to ride. I bet it is. I'm excited about it. Uh, I'm excited about you having a bike. And that's you terrible. and me both. Because I can't do it. Does Chrissy get on the back of the bike with you? You're no, one. she doesn't. She uh, she doesn't trust me enough on the bike. <laughs> she saw me take my last bike off a cliff, you know, so... Uh, How'd that fare for you? Are you okay? <laughs> Did you make it? <laughs> I just... Uh, just barely. I think I'm still in a coma. Mm. Um, no, I, I fell off the bike just... Be- I jumped off the bike, really, just before it went off the cliff, but... Uh, that was good for the knees. Yep, it, uh, it was... An interesting day, and of course, uh, my wife 
comes running out because it was right down the road and sees my bike down the cliff and me alongside the edge. And uh, nope, that was not. Uh, she she hasn't gotten on the bike with me since. Yeah, I wouldn't either. Inconceivable. Yeah. I can't believe hey, the throttle stuck. What are you gonna do? <laughs> Didn't you see the cliff coming up though? What's that? Didn't you see the cliff coming up though? Oh, I saw it. I just uh, unfortunately the throttle stuck and I slammed on the brakes, but the bike still kept going. <laughs> oh wow, wow. I, I figured, uh, you know, once you... Well, I've, I've done that before. Uh, you hit the... Uh, there's two brakes on a bike, right? The right... The rear brake. And the front brake covers 80% of your stopping power. Yeah. And you couldn't... Uh, you started freaking out, panic? Well, I um, I hit the brakes, but like I said, the throttle was stuck. If the throttle still... If the wheel still wants to spin and you've got the brake tied down, you are going to... You know, you can't just slow down before you stop. You just have to come to a complete stop. The bike... Came to a jolting halt. I got off the bike, but the throttle was still stuck. It kept moving. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, uh, I, People I, I, don't seem to realize a motorcycle wants to stay up on two wheels once it's moving. It uh, If you're going in a straight line, it doesn't take much to keep that bike standing up. So I don't know. I always had a hard time keeping it on two wheels. Well, that's uh, maybe if uh, you didn't didn't uh, indulge before getting on. Well, that's true. Maybe they, I don't know. Anyway, Demon Hunter, Ghost Man, Shadow Nation, tonight's guest. Dun, dun, dun. You ready? I'm always ready. <laughs> I caught you drinking beer, Dan. Yeah. Degree in psychology, a South Carolina native, Mr. Eric Lavender stops by, guys. He's the head tour guide of Pirate Tours of South Carolina, or Charleston Pirate Tours. He's going to tell us the haunted truth behind the shadowy corners of Charleston where ghosts of pirates roam and cursed treasure can still be found to this day. Demon Hunter. Wait, did you say treasure? Treasure. It's all around apparently out there in Charleston. But no, you know, I got hooked on the... Uh, I got hooked on the pirate stories, and he's coming on tonight, guys, and it's the greatest one in the United States, Charleston Pirate Tours. Eric Lavender, Demon Hunter, joins us tonight. I'm interested. You've got my you've got my interest peaked, Sean. See? You should be peaking. Charleston Pirate Tours guy. Eric Lavender, head tour guy. And owner. Him and his wife on that. So, uh, or and head tour guide. Yeah, we were just talking to him before the show, and uh, yeah. I think we're going to get a lot of cool information because he really wanted to tell a story before we even got on the air, Sean. Yeah, he started going, and that's the thing. The guy gets paid uh, a living to talk every day, but uh, he, you know th that's the thing. When I was over in the islands, and they were talking about you know all the pirate uh, booty and everything else that uh, went on over there, the plunder. They said the greatest pirate battles. A lot of them happen over in the Americas. Yeah. That's what they yeah. called them back then. The Think Americas. about it. All that uh, trade going back and forth between mm -hmm. the New World and the Old. Uh. Yeah. The East India Trading Company was the big one back then. <laughs> yeah. Is that where you'd want to, like, set up your shop and uh, take over a few uh, ships there? And, yeah. Uh, maybe I, I told steal, you. I'd, steal yourself some booty and bring it back? And, I'd be a, well, I've stole my share of booty, you know, over time. You are your share of booty. <laughs> no laugh, no nothing, huh? <laughs> my share of booty. I'll punch you in the mouth. Yes, he will punch my mouth. Anyway, hey, what's the scoop on the Middle Asia airline? You know, I started following that last week, and uh, I've fallen off a bit this week, and now all of a sudden people are talking about maybe it was UFOs. They are saying that. Saying Bermuda Triangle conspiracy stuff, brother. Uh, you got to admit, it's weird. I was listening to CNN all week. They said the transponder, everything that could happen, did happen, which is just like 100 to 1 odds. And yeah. uh, it, it's but weird. Planes have two transponders on them, one in the back and one in the front. I'm not sure about that. But they said they uh, either one of them went out. And now that they're going back and forth saying they could have been on the in the air for seven hours after they made last contact. Last thing the pilot said was, okay, good night. And that was it. Which, uh, you know, I find weird. There's just something up with the fact they said the plane changed course. That's why they're saying it might be a terrorist attack. But even if it was, even if it exploded in the sky, they would see some type of debris. Well, it depends on how much it broke up upon its landing. Yeah. I mean, if it, if it did a water landing and it landed in deep water and it didn't break up upon landing, then you wouldn't see a lot of debris. It's uh, all like... 
inside the plane. Right, so. it's going to break up. Uh, about, you know, up on hitting the water from the sky, you're going to lose something. A fragment of tail, something, you know? It just seems a lot like a TV show, doesn't it? It like, does, uh, and uh, I bet that, uh, I dare say that might happen within the next year. But what do you think, Demon Hunter? You know? You know, I got, I got to go with the logical explanation uh, here that they suffered some kind of mechanical failure that took them off course, and we just haven't found the plane yet. I've got to go with that right now because there's nothing that tells me that there's not a r- reasonable explanation that we're just missing at this point. No. Well, and, and the fact that, you know, a lot of people are saying the government that way and, and the delay in their safety regulations that they applied. Uh, when of, course, my, of course, my American paranoia, since this happened so close to Vietnam, yeah. or was it... Vietnam or Korea that this was happening over. And now my notes are all messed up and I put them away and I don't you know. You don't have notes. No, I, I think it was, I, I don't know where it was over. Well, uh, it's, the ocean. Well, you're no help to me then. It was over But, the you know, ocean. of course, I've got this whole uh, <laughs> worry. Um, I think it was Korea. Sorry about that before. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've got this whole thought going through my head of, you know, what if it was shot down and there's a cover up involved? Well, I mean, uh, thousands of planes go that route daily. I would doubt, you know, you know. I mean, it could. It's a possibility. Nothing's off the table. But you know, over the course of uh, you know um, aviation history, there's been very few planes other than in the Bermuda Triangle that have just disappeared off the face That's of the earth. Nonsense. Planes disappear all the time. Yes, they just evaporate. But yeah, your logic tells you that it could have been an explosion. A lot of th- I guess there was two Americans on the plane. Oh, well, see right there, it was blown up. No yeah, doubt about see, it. Then. You never know. You never know. But uh, yeah, we can't rule out the possibility from the ca- and I've told you about this 100 times. Go to YouTube, Shadow Nation, Demon Hunter, and you can find the these seasoned air- airline pilots you know, talking about these UFOs on their tails and on their wings, and, and they're amazed by the things they see uh, up there in the sky. There are things happening up there in the air, and, and who's to say that, uh, I know what you're going to say, well, why wouldn't there be more of them? Who knows? Maybe, uh, you know, at this point, I hope it was a UFO. <laughs> I mean, it would give the people a fighting chance. Hey, look at this. That was right the first time. It was off the coast of South Vietnam. So uh, well, then, it, uh, then it turned left, flew over Thailand, back towards Indonesia, it, where it had its last recorded contact, yeah. and then it disappeared. Um, so, you know, it could have just kept going, wound up somewhere in the middle of the Indian Ocean, Sean. Oh, that's true. Could have been flying blind, ran out of fuel. That's what they were saying about... Uh, who am I thinking of here? Amelia Earhart. They said she ran out of fuel. That's what well, they thought. Yeah, I mean, why not? It's, it, think about it. You're, you're out there in the middle of the ocean. If you've lost uh, your me- mechanical controls or your uh, mechanical controls, if you've lost your uh, ability to, <laughs> Big to read where you are, you're, you're kind of flying blind. And if they wound up over the Indian Ocean trying to get back, you know, think about all those planes they found off the coast of Florida now that they think are actually those famous first planes that went missing over uh, the Bermuda Triangle. Yeah, the bombers. That they just lost their instrumentation and they... They wound up flying until they ran out of fuel. Yeah. And some people said, like, the Bermuda Triangle, there was nothing to, uh, no kind of scenery for they could, you know, if they lost control. Yeah. I mean, it's so easy for them to just, you know, why why are we talking about aliens? This, when the most likely thing of losing contact with a plane is, you know, losing their electronic uh, ability to find out where they are, and the plane crashes. Of course, uh, we're talking about the possibility of UFOs or Bermuda Triangle type conspiracy, even though they were outside the Bermuda Triangle, is because, the reason is because, brother, this does not happen in aviation history. Planes do not, and this was a big aircraft. I forget what number. It was, I, I don't think it was a 737. It was larger than that. Planes just don't disappear that often. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And with all our sonar and technology, we're not getting a ping or anything. You got the United States Navy looking for this thing, for Christ's sakes. They can pull submarines out of the depths and nothing to this date. You know, nothing as of yet. That's why we're talking about UFOs or something, you know, ex something paranormal we don't know we don't know most likely they're going to find it uh, rest in peace all the passengers of course uh, laying on the bottom of the ocean somewhere but uh, that's why we're talking about it. to answer your question sir 
Since 1944, Sean, a total of 24 planes went have gone missing. Since 1944. And now, how many of those were from Bermuda, Bermuda Triangle incident? Uh, I don't have any information on that. Okay, but, uh, 22 airliners have went missing. Now, what was the size of some of those? Were they jumbo jets like this one? 1947, a British uh, aircraft uh, headed for Buenos Aires. Um, vanished on its way to Chile. Let's see. Investigation still not complete. So that one's missing and never found. Hmm. Um, October 1972, yeah. uh, an Air Force charter headed for uh, Ch- also it's headed for Chile. Yeah. Ashed, uh, not found. Um, geez, in eight, 1985, an Eastern Airlines flight headed for, uh, for, uh, headed to Miami vanished. Well, that was probably a Bermuda Triangle one. Right, right. Um, but you would have to say 22 out of every plane that flies in the sky, even 22 is a very low count. It doesn't happen every day is my comment oh, I made. Oh, no, no, I mean, we're talking, we're talking 60 years, 20 some planes have gone missing. And out of those, probably only a handful have never been found. And let's say, let's say out of that handful that this, who's going to roll out UFO? Who's going to roll out paranormal? We can't find, we don't know the answer. And that's why skeptics, you know, the, the not the skeptics, the uh, cynical skeptics hate to even look at that as a possibility. But the fact of the matter is, until we know otherwise, you know, we just don't know. Does that make sense? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, Sean. I, I don't want to go. I don't want to go off the deep end on this one. I don't want to start thinking that uh, that it's paranormal and then oh. just have my, you know, I honestly, who doesn't have a hope to find out that these people are like have landed on the. Hey, that's it, Sean. This is lost. We're in the middle of lost. See, it's like Gilligan's Island. They're get, punch you in the they head. are the island, Sean. They are the island. They are the island. Be the island. I never watched Lost. Did you watch I never it saw the final season? It's, it's uh, one of those things that everybody who's watched the final season told me how much they hated it, so I never went back and watched the final season. So out of Peppy. He never went back. Well, you know, I like I said, you you just don't know. In my mind, they're all still lost. I would say, I wonder how many aircraft travel our skies in a year. I'd break it down in a week's time through all the airlines and, and all that. How many aircrafts go that route daily? And it's just, what I'm saying is the circumstances at which it happened were so odd and so out of the ordinary that it has everybody baffled. I mean, the United States has gotten involved, for Christ's sakes. They want to know. They're like, wow, this is weird. So you can't deny the fact that it's definitely weird. And if it was a terrorist attack, you know, terrorists are usually dumb dumb guys that, uh, you know, st- how hard is it to strap dynamite to your chest and get on, you know, and, and blow up a bunch of people and take life, uh, f- human life, because you're an idiot. Um, you know, they don't know how to take out the transponders and all this stuff. Usually, usually. I mean, maybe they got, uh, you know, some smart idiot that came on there and decided to do all this, uh, go through the trouble. But uh, why would you knock out the transponder? If you're just trying to blow up the plane, who do you care if they track you or not? You know what I mean? If, if you're, if it's a terrorist attack, Sean, people who are interested in creating terror take credit for a terrorist attack. There you go. Now it's, um, you said it all. We agreed again. I we, believe we agreed oh on the gosh. last show. I know. That's, that's that's not we, okay. I have to change my mind. It's definitely a terrorist attack, Sean. And, uh, <laughs> Without they, a doubt. They, okay, they so they stole the plane and they're going to re uh, create turn the plane into a giant bomb and then launch it towards um, somebody, and yeah. that's what they're doing. So you you know it, it just like I said, it was weird in every way. So go out on a limb here, make your prediction for what's going to happen here. In the next following Every, month. He's going to be missing for seven years and then come back with some incredible alien story to tell us. You think so? Sure, why not? That'd be we're a video show. Nobody can sue us if we're wrong. That's true. <laughs> we can say anything we want. Kind of like the weatherman. <laughs> <laughs> exactly like the weatherman. Demon Hunter in the news. <laughs> oh, that's the wrong. That's tonight's guest. <laughs> you don't want that. In the news, Demon Hunter. It's always fresh. It's always exciting. Sometimes it's a little weird and odd, and we love doing it. And straight from the G&D Show vaults, and it starts right now. 
Ooh, now it is. It starts right now. It starts right now. We haven't done That's a right. uh, we haven't done a GD show news in such a long time. I don't know what to do, Demon Hunter. Well, uh, why don't I start, Sean? Well, you can if you want to, I guess. Um, I'm actually ready. I will start with the Utah man accused of stealing a 190 million year old dinosaur footprint. Oh! The, I, uh, uh, does they, Hallmark, Hallmark make a card for that? You can apologize. <laughs> like, you, where are you going to sell a dinosaur footprint? Anyway, it's, it's, uh, anyway, anyway sold it. Salt Lake City, Utah, folks. Oh, wait, Sean, I have to give that to you. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's been a while. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for the g and drinking game. That means Sean and I are going to pick stories from the news by their titles. Weird news that only we read here at the Wiz Man Gaming Show, but other people write for us. Uh, other people like the Huffington Post, the Associated Press, and writers, and many others. Uh, we'd like to thank them for providing us with the news and remind you that since Sean and I have not read the stories in advance, we tend to make a lot of mistakes. This is where the Ghost Man and Demon Hunter drinking game comes into effect. Every time Sean and I mispronounce a word, you take a drink. By the end of the show, you will be sloshed, trust me. Uh, I would like to remind you that if you're listening to this show on your iPod while driving in your car, don't play the g and drinking game. And if you're playing Drive later this evening, listen responsibly. Hey, do you think Hula Girls wear panties under those grass skirts? Um, I have no idea, Sean. Because the one on my desk doesn't have panties on. I mean, she, it goes up to Stop her. Stop lifting up the Hula, school, the hula Girls, uh... <laughs> Grass skirt. It goes up to her crack and then it stops and it's just a big spring, you know? That doesn't do much. Salt Lake City, Utah. <laughs> AP News uh, reports a Utah man has been indicted on federal charges of stealing a fossilized dinosaur footprint from the okay. Jurassic period. Oh. The U.S. Attorney's Office in Utah announced Wednesday that. A grand jury returned an indictment against 35-year-old Jared Asher yeah. of Moab. Asher drink, of Moab. Drink. Okay. He is, I said him right. He is facing up to 20 years in prison on the most serious of four counts. Ooh, uh, yeah. Um, let's see here. Authorities in southeast Utah say that the three-toed ancient track was... Huh? Drink. last month from a sandstone on Hell's Revenge Trail in the Sand Flats. Re <laughs> Sounds like a nice vacation spot. The Sand Flats. You can you can uh, take a drink, folks. I, I turned my head and lost my place. In the Sand Flats recreation area near Moab. Moab. Recreation. There you go. There's that drink. Yeah. Recreation area. Slam that stuff. <laughs> Uh, messages at Eli's Eler's house were not immediately returned. Bueller, Bueller. It's unknown if he has an attorney yet. Utah Bur Bureau of Land Management uh, Director Paleontologist Rebecca Hunt Forrester. What was that last name? <laughs> Forrester says. <laughs> Was the building? dinosaur <laughs> tracks are 190 million years old. Ooh. He says they are one of a kind tracks that don't have a price. 190 million years old. 190 million years old. John. Now, if a human demon hunter, baby brother, if a human made it that long, would Social Security still pay? You think? <laughs> what is it? 65 in America now for Social Security? I'm just wondering, Sean. You know. Dinosaur footprint, 190 million years old. Yeah, yeah. Um, where are you going to keep that? You know, it's... Uh, well, in your house. I mean... Yeah, what? but if it's stolen, you can't show it off. I mean... Well, I'm sure he tried to sell it. Like you can go, hey, check out my recreation of this 190 million year old footprint. And right. people are going to stand there going, how do you get a recreation of a 190 million year old footprint? I don't get it. I don't well, I got a friend on the inside, see? Yeah, yeah, that's it. I, I wanted to track a Bigfoot. They seem to be, uh, you know, all over the place. And uh, Shadow Nation, if there's any listeners out there that want to give uh, Demon and Hunter and myself a uh, track of Bigfoot that you've uh, that you've picked up over the years, I could I could use one for the studio, Demon Hunter. Just like a Conjuring poster, that'd be nice. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh, oh. yeah, that's right. Kick, kick. I see it. I see where it's going. UFO sightings map. What weird UFO shape does your state? 
C, Demon Hunter. You ready for this? I'm ready for it. Comes out of the Huffington Post. Huffington Post, weird news. We love you guys, the Huffington Post. UFO sightings were big in 2013. We know that a lot of them will turn out to be drones. But it doesn't change the fact that people in every state are seeing weird shapes in the sky. More than 6,500, Demon Hunter. 6,500. More than 6,500 of them just last year, according to the Mutual UFO Network data. We know those guys. Hmm? Yeah, I, 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 I've heard of them, sure. Yeah, we've had some friends uh, work for those guys before. Outer, uh, wait, Outer Places, a UFO news aggression site with time. I've seen things you people wouldn't believe. <laughs> I've seen things. I like that one. What ties to the UFO Museum in Roswell, New Mexico, turned MUFON's 2013 data into the awesome graphic below? It shows that most of us see spheres. Drink up anyway, guys. Spheres. When we call in to report UFOs, others see stars, fireballs, circles, and discs. It turns out that Vermont, Arizona, and Maine are the most paranoid out there. Using info from the graphic the Washington Post pointed out. That those three states have about four sightings per 100,000 people. More than any other state. You get that? That was uh, Vermont. Well, all these sightings occurred down north, or down down north, down south. Well, could that be that the skies are more open out there? Vermont, Arizona, and Maine are the most paranoid out there. They say, but the skies are clear there because over there, Arizona is the desert, and Maine I'm not sure about. I guess the ocean. You're over there, Vermont. I'm not sure at all. I know there's a lot less pollution and stuff. That, uh, it says that those three states have about four sightings per 100,000 people, more than any other state, Demon Hunter. Additionally, Montanans, drink up, guys, I'm not sure about that. Montanans see more fireballs. Indians? Yeah, it's mont Annans. And I'm teaching my daughter how to read. See more fireballs than any other weird UFO shape, Montana. So in Montana. After you're done, it says, uh, check out the Bigfoot graphic below. I checked that out, too, and I don't like that. It's a Bigfoot print. That's what we're talking about. Yeah. It says it shows a 92-year-old Sasquatch sighting across the United States. Wait, wait, wait. Which shows 92 years of Squatch sightings across the United States. Is that the, is that the term for Sasquatch? I guess that's the new term. Yeah. Well, you know, we got a place out here in Indiana, Demon. I remember we were going to do that for a uh, TV, uh, for a uh, place that was calling us up. We were going to go out there and check that place out. Remember that? I do remember. It uh, It just never happened. You know, that seems to be the story of our lives, Sean. Look at this story. Women are more likely to orgasm during a hookup if... And then it leaves you hanging. i got to read that one next week. <laughs> huh? That's a good one. When do you think women are more likely to orgasm, Demon? Um, when they're standing on their heads? I don't know. <laughs> How many women stand on their heads while you're... Uh, well, that would be fun, actually. I have to try that sometime. Huh? Videotape it for the show next week, Sean. I will. I'm going to Skype it. You said we're going to do more Skype. We should do more Skype of you um, on your head mm. with, I don't know. So what I say? Montana, guys. Get my show, I'm trying to get my, my screen back up. My entire screen went blank right in the middle of your reading your news, Sean. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. Well, no, I was talking about the UFOs. So remember, if they want to go out and check it out, guys, Montana. Seems to be the most place, uh, the biggest place, most sightings, that you could go out and check that out. Anyway, moving right around, weird news, thanks Huffington Post, Pee Wee Herman's bike from Pee Wee's Big Adventure, I love that show, sells for $36.6 on eBay. $36.06? Yeah, no, $36,600 on eBay. You ready? Pee Wee's bike fits, huh? That could only be somebody who's a, like, wants the collector's item, because I mean... Oh, it, I, I don't get it. It's, I mean, it was a fun show and all, but who yes. throws $36,000 at a bicycle? It was Pee Wee. Oh, it was probably Vegas. Vegas, that one restaurant, buys all kinds of movie collectibles and stuff. They pay big for that. Remember, there was a TV show. The guys were trying to buy the original Jaws, which they named Bruce Demon Hunter, and I seen him. He's on top of a billboard. The original Jaws is on top of a billboard at a, like a, a, a used car, no, a junkyard. Can you believe that? That's horrible. And we're huge Jaws fans. 
Anyway, and Bruce is just sitting up there. He's sitting up there with the weather and everything. He's discolored. Pee Wee's bike fetched some big bucks on eBay Thursday, Demon Hunter Shadow Nation. The shiny red and white bicycle used by Pee Wee Herman in Pee Wee's Big Adventure sold for $36,600, or more than three times the $10,000 reward offered for the return of the bike in the 1985 film. Remember that when that fat kid stole his bike? Oh, fact. right, right, right. Yeah. It should be noted that Pee Wee had no intention of paying the reward since whoever returns the bike is obviously the person who stole it. So they don't deserve any reward, says Pee Wee. That also, that's also, drink up guys, more than three times the $10,000 $10, uh, $10, the seller paid for it back in 2010. On the other hand, Pee Wee set a much higher price for the bike in the film. The seller says in the listing that he needs to ditch the bike because my family is getting larger. The only downside is that the bike doesn't exactly look like it did in the film at the moment it's in pieces. <gasps> yeah, so basically it was he sold. Spoiler. Yeah, so basically it was sold s some assembly required. Why would you tear up the bike? Um, unless they just want unless they wanted it for the parts. I mean, maybe they <laughs> They stored it somewhere, maybe, and they took it apart to store it. Uh, they might have. To fit it in their safe. I mean, if that's a valuable item. Yeah. They could put it in the safe. I don't know. Hey, Sean. Yeah, what? What's going on there? You're not dreaming. There is now a bacon alarm clock. Oh, my God. Huffington Post, again, tells us, now you can be assured that you're... that your bacon will fill your dreams, or at least be interrupting them. Uh, wakey, wakey, it's a bacon alarm clock. Wakey, wakey, hands off stanky. <laughs> Oscar Meyer cooked up this gizmo to connect to your smartphone. Damn you, Oscar Meyer. Into a fragrance frying pan of sizzling you-know-what. Oh. You plug in the small uh, re rectangle that attaches into the iPhone head jack okay. and enabled by an app. The sound and smell of bacon oh. assaults your senses when it's time to rise and shine. Kind of like mom used to make, right? That's right. Oscar Mayer will give out 4,700 of the devices in a drawing through April 4th. Oh, wow. The company said it is a it, in their press release. You can have a drink, folks. I goofed up. Uh, you can go to this uh, same article in the Huffington Post, folks, to find the link to go on and uh, enter to win your own Oscar Mayer bacon alarm clock uh, oh, wow. connection for your iPhone. Uh, to inspire you as if bacon lollipops and bacon stri uh, striped cars were not enough, Oscar Mayer has created a sexy bacon-filled fantasy. No, I'm ready for it. <laughs> Is there any other kind? No. Uh, to announce its alarm clock. Yeah. Um, so, uh, time never smelled so much like a Sunday morning. Uh, so, that's right, folks. You can now get your own bacon alarm clock. This uh, particular device is not sold in any Jewish stores, but um, that was a joke, Sean. Ah! Because they don't have okay. swine in the Jewish stores. Uh, well, yeah, that's uh, that was the joke. Thanks a lot. That was good. I liked it. Why, why don't you repeat it twice? Make it even less funny. He was. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of taken away from it. <laughs> I've been cracking your jokes for years. Damon Hunter, we got time for one more. Can I do it now? You ready? Of course you can. Of course you can. Wesley Warren Jr., man with a 132-pound scrotum, dead at 49. Now, this is worthy of GND News. <laughs> I, I saw this story and I didn't even have to like look at the story, Sean. No. I just sent it over to you because oh, I yeah. knew you'd want this story. The man's name, Wesley Warren Jr., man with 132 pounds, scrotum, dead at 49. That's scrotum, folks. Wesley Warren Jr., who received worldwide notoriety because of his problems with the scrotum that grew to 132 pounds, died Friday at a Las Vegas hospital. He was 49. No cause of death was officially in that, huh? Whatever did he die from? I don't know. 132 pound, 132 pound crushed scrotum uh, 
Might take some blood from the old brain. No cause of death was officially announced, but Warren's roommate, Joey Hurtado, drink up guys, told the Las Vegas Review Journal that Warren had suffered two heart attacks recently, Demon Hunter. He was in the hospital for five and a half weeks, Hurtado, drink up guys, told the paper. He had infections that I think were brought on by his diabetes, and then he had those heart attacks. Hurtado, drink again guys, also told the paper he didn't believe that his friend's testicle removal surgery last year was a factor in his death. When Warren had the surgery last April, he entered the operating room weighing 552 pounds. <laughs> 13 Jeez. hours later, he was 200 pounds lighter. You get that? That's insane. 552 pounds. 13 hours later, he was 200 pounds lighter. Wow. Warren said his scrotum first became enlarged in May of 2008 when he suffered an injury on his right testicle. Be careful on that uh, motorcycle demon. Yeah, really? Ow. Now I'm, I'm worried. He said, I woke up the next day and my scrotum was the size of a honeydew melon. <sighs> I don't know how big the honeydew melon is, but uh, if they're anything like a watermelon, you know. Well, honeydew melon. They're, they're, that, those are the honeydews. You, you go in, they're like cantaloupe, Sean, only the green inside. Okay. I'll never be able to eat a honey melon now. Honey, <laughs> honey Ever again. Melon. Yeah. Anyway, he told the Huffington Post live in August, my personal hell was just beginning with every passing month. Demon Hunter warned Scrotum grew three pounds or more, and with no health insurance, he had little opportunity to seek help until he became internationally known for his freakish bulge people donated and helped out. Well, rest in peace. Wesley Warren Jr. Man with 132 pounds scrotum dead at 49. That's a shame. That is a shame. It is a shame. And that, that's why, you know, he was one year shy of Obamacare. <laughs> oh. Oh. Wonder if oh, Obamacare that, would... would uh, I, did, I didn't think you had the balls to say that joke, Sean. Ah! My God, it's flowing, man. <laughs> Demon Hunter. Ghost man. It's a... Well, I've got to wait for the delay. It's all <laughs> amped up and ready to go here, and I'm ready to go, and you're ready to go. I'm it's always a, ready to go. Yeah, you are. It's a G&D original series put together by Nathan and myself. Where we travel the haunted back roads of America and the world and find you each week a new legend, a story from Bigfoot to mer people, mermaids, to the bunny man. That cuts women's heads off, apparently, in the uh, in the forest. To the Sasquatch! I already said that. To the Pudwudgies! We bring you a new legend each week, guys. And this week's legend is... Dun-dun-dun! Wait for it. Wait for it. There you go, Demon Hunter. Dun-dun-dun! Blackbeard's ghost. Huh? That's correct, Sean. That's... <laughs> Is that all you got? That's correct, Sean. I, I'm sorry. You, you're coming in a little fuzzy for me. I'm I'm having trouble hearing you. Anyway, fuzzy, you're kind of breaking up, too, every once in a while. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what's going on here. Anyway, guys, Blackbeard's ghost is a legend this week. It's a very real legend. People talk about it. Of course, Blackbeard, we'll talk about him a little later on the show. He was one of the most ruthless pirates in history, Demon Hunter. That is correct, sir. Yeah. And apparently, uh, in as we'll find out... You still there, Sean? Yes, I'm still here with a lot of static on your end. No, now it stopped. Now it stopped. That's you, a little better. What are you doing over there? Anyway, guys, Blackbeard's ghost. Uh, we'll find out more. Apparently, a huge battle happened in the harbor, Charleston Harbor, where Blackbeard succumbed to, well, I guess a knife cut through the throat and a gunshot to the chest. And they say uh, Blackbeard fought to the very end. He still struggled to get to the captain of the British Navy. Uh, of course, he fell to his doom on the floor right there of the British ship, and they severed his head, Demon Hunter, as a message to all the pirates in the world that the British Navy would not take this kind of outrage from pirateers. So they hung his head on the front of the ship. Yeah, and they cruised around with Blackbeard's head on the front. Now they say, Demon Hunter, that when Blackbeard was Blackbeard, Black, drink up guys, when Blackbeard was beheaded, they threw his headless body in the water, and it still circled the boat three times with the head screaming, Come on, Edward. Go forward. And the body circled the boat three times before it, before it dove to the depths 
Ah, now I saw a documentary on uh, Blackbeard starring Johnny Depp, and I seem to remember there have been a uh, there being mermaids and a fountain of youth involved. So well, it wasn't I, a documentary uh, so much as on Stranger Tides. The third <laughs> oh, okay, episode. so it wasn't. A documentary. <laughs> oh, Disney. Oh. You can make even ruthless pirates look funny. <laughs> I love it. Anyway, they carried his head around on the front of the much different times than today, huh? It, it's funny. Where where do the legends of his ghost come from? Sean? Well, the legends from his ghost. I didn't want to say too much because we're, I, I hopefully we get into it tonight, and uh, uh, Eric will be able to clear up some facts. But he's supposedly guarding treasure on the beaches of Charleston, South Carolina, and some people said his boat, the Queen Marie's Revenge, he ran it ashore. To get rid of his pirate friends that were working the boat, his crew that were working the boat, so he could have the treasure to himself. So he ran the boat ashore, buried the treasure, and then, of course, he met his demise before he was able to reclaim the treasure. So they see his ghost walking the beaches nightly out there. That's the ghost story. Ah. And he's, they say you could follow him to the uh, treasure, but you'll never make it to... To dig it up, because Black well, there's a challenge we have to take, Sean. That's it. I say we go out there. Plus, we get some beach time, some suntan. <laughs> huh? We'll go now out there. There's a G and D adventure. That Arc. is that is an adventure. Demon Hunter, we are 57, and this week's zombie alert system. Dun, dun, dun. Do we have music? Yeah, here it goes. Hi, this is Matt Milk from the Zombie Research Society. And here's your weekly update from the GND Zombie Alert System. Now back to you, Sean and Nate. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Matt. That's right, folks. It's that time where Sean and I scour the news, the information through uh, NOAA and other uh, reports that, regarding chemical and biological spills, information in the uh, news regarding anything that could lead to a zombie attack. Zombies. It's brought to you by the Zombie Research Society, uh, as seen on The Talking Dead and the and Midnight Syndicate. And it starts right now. And Rot Talk. We threw that in there. Rot Talk. Rot Talk, Rot Talk. Yeah. Uh, Walking Dead. <laughs> this week, we've received news of a naked man high on drugs who was shot dead in Florida after biting the face off of an 18-year-old in, in a random street attack. Oh, not again. Yep. And an alleged zombie, Meshuggah. Charles Baker, got <laughs> naked oh. and bit um, off a chunk of, uh, oh, of a n another gentleman, Jeffrey Blake's, arm, yeah. including a large chunk of his bicep. Oh. Blake, 40, 48, was still being attacked when police arrived to rescue him. Uh, bringing the incident, uh, this particular incident, brought the flesh-eating attacks uh, up to 34 in the, uh, since the first attack by Alexander Kinyu in May, uh, on May 25th of, um, of last year. Yeah. So that's, we're talking, Sean, in like a month of um, last year, they probably had over 30 attacks, and they've just been continuing on uh, since then. Okay. Well, With I know oil spills, and remember the uh, the chemical spill that we were following down in Florida right. uh, end of last year. Yeah. The attacks have been getting more and more outrageous. So, uh, and now they're introducing. A super bacteria to help clean up these oil spills. Oh, no. Yes, a bacteria, Sean, no. designed to uh, clean up these spills for us. Uh, so we all know what happens when we get bacteria to do the work for us. Um, it, it's occurring right now, I believe, on the Hudson River. Ooh, that's close to you, buddy. That's real close to me. So, uh, or it happened end of last year. So, I mean, we're talking serious danger here, Sean. What are we at at our zombie uh, status? We are at guarded still, sir. Barely okay. hanging on. <laughs> so, I would say, Sean, we are at guarded in uh, the U.S., except for Florida, 
where I think they need to go up uh, probably another level. What would be the next stage up, sir? The next stage would be elevated, Demon Hunter. We're definitely not going to go down to low. Not with these. <laughs> no, so I'd say the, the U.S. in general is at guarded. And in Florida, folks, yeah, I'd say you're at elevated. There's a lot of biting going on down there. So keep on the lookout. And remember, report any strange activities to the Ghost Man and Demon Hunter show so we can carry the news and keep everybody safe. Uh, thanks to the Zombie Research Society and Midnight Syndicate. Folks, this is your zombie alert system. You're so professional. Real quick, rot talk each week, guys. We're huge fans of The Walking Dead, as are you, Shadow Nation. Each week with rot talk, we talk about new episodes. Well, we don't. Sometimes we put out spoiler alerts. New stuff that's happening on The Walking Dead and tell you what we think is going to happen this week. Not necessarily what's going to happen, but what we think we do this week with rot talk. We find out what's happening tonight on The Walking Dead. Well, that's right, Sean. I, I, I believe last week. That's right, folks. Remember, we are going to talk about things that have happened up to date. So if you haven't seen it, stick your fingers in your ears and go la 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 because we don't want to spoil anything for you. Sean, the group is still all separated. They are, Demon Hunter. Everybody thought last week that uh, Daryl and um, we know her by Emily. I forget her name on the show. That the younger girl was going to do it. You know, her first drink was moonshine. He gave it to her. They were all happy and fluffy and everything. And then he met some real bad people. So the group finds himself this week heading to the Arrive and Survive camp. I forget the name of it. They're all heading to that direction. I'm excited to see what's going to happen, Demon Hunter. What do you think? The question, of course, being, is Daryl going to continue his look for his young blonde uh, sweetie? Or is he going to... Uh wind up joining a whole new gang because let's face it everybody loves daryl but daryl is not a leader he's a follower he likes getting his orders and carrying out commands so has he found his new the new um brother that he's been looking for or has his new relationship stirred something in him that's going to make him break out on his own and think about others before himself i don't know demon Hunter. i think it's just rules of laws of survival at this point he's a survivalist and uh when you got six men around you heavily armored armored uh armed you kind of tend to go with whatever they say for now <laughs> What do you think? This is true, Sean, and I do think that uh, he's going to continue the hunt. I think this week we're going to lose out on finding out what happens, so I think we're going to be focused more on the other two groups getting closer and closer to uh, the the safe zone. And, of course, we have the whole issue that we, we missed uh, a chance to talk about the fact that there's a gentleman out there who claims he knows what happened and how to fix it. That's true. We didn't bring that up. And... The funny thing is about it, he has a mullet. Who would have thought the guy that could save the world has a mullet? Hey, I never, never, never question the mullet, man. Never. The, qu <laughs> the mullet knows all. You had one way back in the day, right? I really did. I was a child of the 80s. What do you want? You were a child of the 80s with the mullet and the... And the parachute pants. And uh, you will never know the comfort that comes from a good pair of parachute pants. See? No, I would. I had a pair of parachute pants. <laughs> I had some sneakers in there. But, Demon Hunter, we got to go to break. We are past the hour. It's 8.04, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight's band, The Bomb Blasters. Name of the song, Good to Be Alone. We'll be right back with tonight's guest, Eric Lavender, the head, the owner of Pirate Tours of South... I'm sorry, Charleston Pirate Tours. And uh, we're going to talk about Ghost and what's going on behind the scenes out that way, guys. Well, Demon Hunter, anything to add? Ben. We'll be right back, guys. This is The Bomb Blasters.
Come back here. This is Scott Wilson from The Walking Dead, and you're listening to the Ghost Man and Demon Hunter Show. Welcome back, Shadow Nation. This is the one, the only, Mystifying Oracle Radio. So good to have you. Wow. Thanks, Scott Wilson, for The Walking Dead. (laughs) How amazing is Scott, huh? The only place I've ever heard him on radio talk about how he had his severed head in a plastic bag in the kitchen or whatever. In the closet. In the closet. (laughs) Yeah, he had it in the closet. But tonight's guest, we've already kept him too long, from the uh, Charleston Pirate Tours. He has a degree in psychology, a South Carolina native, Mr. Eric Lavender, the owner of the Charleston Pirate Tours. Eric, what's going on, buddy? Oh, everything's great. How are you guys? (laughs) Doing great. Doing better now that you're on. We were talking about pirates all night. We couldn't wait to get you in here. Okay, you know so, it, it's. I'm here. To, I'm here to fulfill your needs as far as <laughs> pirates go. You know, as far as heads and safes, you're on your own on that one. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Eric, I gotta say, my entire like my entire family is quickly moving to South Carolina. They seem uh, a cl- little farther north than you, up to the Myrtle Beach area. But it seems like everybody yeah. in my family, they're all just like, all right, you know, it's too cold up here north. Let's move down south. And uh, South Carolina seems to be the point everybody's aiming for. Well, it's um, it seems to be a spot that's becoming more and more popular, um, and I think it has to do with the fact that if you still have family up north, if you go all the way down into South Florida, you're adding 12, 14 hours worth of drive time on your trip back home, and if you stop here, we have decent weather, you know, the cost of living is fairly decent, so a lot of people are stopping halfway and staying, and <laughs> And it's uh, and, and I've been around like these parts all my life, so and I've kind of, you know, I'm just used to it, and I and I can understand why because it is a it, South Carolina is one of the few states that you can literally go to the beach and hang around the beach until noon, and by five o'clock in the afternoon, be dining in a nice restaurant up in the mountains. You know, and and it's, it's, you know, everything's close. You don't have to drive half your day to I mean, or I should say, more than a day to get anywhere you want to go. You can have mountains and you can have beach all within a an easy drive. Right now, I, I tell you, Eric, I was looking at pictures of the tours, and you guys, without a doubt, everybody online talks about how great the Charleston Pirate Tours are, and specifically how great you are with your parrot on your arm. What's his name? His name's Captain Bob. Captain Bob. You and the pirate, you take people down the haunted and mysterious, you know, historical back alleys of Charleston. You show people the shadowy side, the historical side. Can you paint a picture for our listeners? Because when I was in the Caribbean, they said a lot of the pirate activity happened in the Americas, you know, back here in the United States. Can you paint a picture about Charleston back in the 1700s and what it was like with the pirates and all that stuff going on? Well, going all the way back to its earliest beginnings, Charlestown, when it was founded in 1670. Now, next month, the city will be 344 years old. Wow. And when the city was founded, it was not what we would call today probably a royal colony. In other words, it really wasn't a holding of the British government. The the city, as it is, or the, the, the territory called Carolina, was a land grant. It was given to these men called the Eight Lords Proprietor who got King Charles II out of exile and got him back on the throne of England, and he gave them this land. Now, what's kind of fun, the boundaries of Carolina in the early years, uh, and, I, and I love it when I have people taking my tour and they tell me, yeah, we live in Arizona, New Mexico, California, and I say, well, you know, one time you can tell people you live in South Carolina. Because the boundaries of Carolina were basically the southern border of Virginia, the Atlantic Ocean, and then across the panhandle of Florida west. And it literally stretched to the Pacific Ocean because nobody really knew how big this place was. They just said, you have all the land west. And, um, and Virginia was a territory of the, the, the British. And then south, you had Florida, which was Spanish. And they gave them everything in between, all the way west. Wow. So... Um, 
So when that came about, and not being a royal colony, well, what, what that basically means is we didn't have the Royal Navy. We didn't have a royal military. We, we didn't have any type of a governance over the city except these proprietary governors given to us by the eight lords proprietor. Well, for that reason, we all had to rely on each other. It was a very tough sledding back in those days. And so everybody had to rely on each other. So it was just you had to get what you could get wherever you could get it. And nobody came to town with better stuff than pirates. <laughs> pirates, would, pirates would come into the harbor in our early years. And, um, and really, it was, um, it, this was a wide open pirate town. In fact, I'll give you, I'll tell you what I'm doing. I've got actually, and I'll plug this guy. I've never met him. I've got a, a it's actually a doctoral dissertation. And it was um, a guy getting his doctorate in philosophy and history from Harvard University. Was written, this thing was written in May of 2006. And I'm going to plug this guy. He may have, he probably never even heard of me. Plug but his it. name is Mark Gillis Hanna. And he wrote this thesis called The Pirate Nest. And all it is is about the impact of piracy on Charlestown and, um, and Newport, Rhode Island. Because really and truly, if it hadn't been for the black market we had with pirates, I really don't know if the city would have survived in the early years. Because they came to town with ships loaded with stuff. We were a very currency-poor city. Right. And they came to town with gold and silver and ships loaded with stuff and sold it to the merchants for next to nothing. And anybody else that wanted to buy it from them for next to nothing. So bottom line is our early pirate history was actually when we rolled out the red carpet for them but unfortunately things did take a shift and change in the dynamics when things happened in england with the war the, the queen anne's war or the war of spanish succession because a lot of pirates got involved in the war effort as privateers for the queen now the queen couldn't pay these men they didn't have money to pay them per se so everything they made privateering was the ill-gotten gains they were stealing from the French and the Spanish supply ships, you know, in the war effort. And then they would turn around and use it or sell it. So that's how they were making their money. But when the war ended, all the letters of Mark, which documents people could legally do what they were doing as privateers, they weren't any good anymore. So the queen couldn't pay them because they didn't have any money to pay them. So she got rid of somewhere between thirty-five and 40,000 of these people. She couldn't afford to pay anymore. Wow. She couldn't afford to pay them to begin with. Everything they were getting paid is what they were stealing. Dirty. Bottom line, bottom line, piracy exploded because these people had to make a living somehow. So around 1715 is when piracy really started to launch. And frankly, by 1717, it had gotten so bad that you just really couldn't even sail out of Charlestown Harbor without concerns you might be attacked. Now, do you think and, some of this pi pirate influence that uh, you know grew in 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 around the area is what mm -hmm. caused the uh, the fo founding fathers of South Carolina to be the initiators who like were the first ones to declare independence from England? Yeah, well, there were actually two times in Charleston history where we wanted. It's interesting. It was kind of like two revolutions, if you will. First on was around 1720, because we didn't have a government. We didn't have any help from England. We had the eight lords proprietor. And so we wanted England to buy us. We wanted England to buy the colony of, Car of South Carolina. We were desperate to have a government here that would take care of us. Sounds kind of familiar today. Now. But anyway, <laughs> uh, we were desperate. So finally, King George decided that, yeah, we will buy South Carolina off the eight lords proprietor. And by 1822, we had become a royal colony. So we had all the, all the perks and the benefits of being a royal colony, the Royal Navy, the Royal military, um, you know, governors that were appointed by the King and all, and all the goodies that came with that. But then of course, by 1770s, we were trying to get away from England. <laughs> because we wanted to be independent. You know, the entire country, all the colonies wanted to be independent. So, yeah, and the first decisive battle of the revolution was fought in the Charlestown Harbor on the 28th of June in 1776, even before the Declaration of Independence was signed. But, of course, that was way after the golden age of piracy, and I don't want to go down a road that we're not going down tonight, but that just kind of gives you an idea of what 
the tremendous amount of history that the city has when it comes to its uh, its involvement with its early years and then and then the the revolution and then into the civil war and on forward to the day but anyway back to our you know our pirates at hand yeah um i the tour itself focuses on a period of time that's really only a few months long that 17 august of 1717 to about november of 1718 and that's when we really had the worst trouble with pirates here in our city. Now, 1715 to 1725, throughout the entire uh, Western Hemisphere, piracy was bad, but it was really bad here during those few months. Because on those, in those few months, we had pirates show up in the harbor on five occasions and literally wreak havoc on the city and its inhabitants. Because of what they were doing, they would sit down outside the harbor, they would steal ships, kidnap people, hold them for ransom, steal, leave with, take ships and leave with them. So it was a pretty bad period of time. Now, I tell you, Eric, there's the side of historical side of piracy. And then, of course, right. there's the darker side that you tell, you, know, you tell people on the tour about. Can you talk about some of these hauntings and some of these stories of Blackbeard and some of these other ghosts that roam? Okay. Charleston. Sure, sure. Absolutely. Well, as far as the hauntings go, one of my favorite haunting stories, well, let me back up and tell you this and kind of preface what I was going to tell you about talking about this first. Uh -huh. Pirate executions. Between July the 3rd of 1717 and uh, December 10, 1718, well, depending on the accounts that you read, uh, South Carolina executed somewhere in the neighborhood of fifty three pirates. I mean, I've seen this, you know, I've seen it 49, I've seen 50, I've seen 53. I lean more towards 53 just based on some of my research. Wow. Now, here's the thing. When they hanged pirates, they hanged them outside the wall that surrounded our city because Charlestown was a walled city. And it's, they hanged them down on the end of the peninsula. Now, if any of you are familiar with Charleston, that's an area that we refer to as the Battery. That's that section of town where at the end of the peninsula, there's a bunch of huge antebellum mansions. You've got a park down there with statues and cannons and monuments. And Well, none of that was down there. In fact, there's a street about halfway between where the seawall begins and that park called Water Street. Water Street was a saltwater creek called Van Horse Creek. And right along that marsh of Van Horse Creek is where we executed the pirates. And this is what we did with them. And it's kind of nasty because colonial law did not permit a man from convicted of piracy a couple of things. Number one, he was not going to be given a proper burial. And that was a big deal to pirates because they didn't think if they got a burial, their spirit would just wander aimlessly without any rest through eternity. So they were big on that superstition. The other thing they were not afforded was an audience with clergy. So not only were they afraid of their spirit wandering aimlessly, they would not even have that passage into um, into heaven, if you will, by getting their soul right with a preacher before we hang them. So you got that as a backdrop to this. They would build the gallows, which were really very crude, nothing more than a couple of poles in the ground and a beam that sort of connected the two poles. And then a rope would be suspended from the cross beam. They would stand the pirates in the back of little small wagons, these little two-wheel wagons, and tie their hands and feet and put the noose around their neck. And then yank the wagon from beneath them or just simply kick them out of the back of this wagon. Now, here was their problem. They would not fall a distance sufficient for their neck to break. In other words, they would just hang there doing what they referred to in those days. They had two things they called it, the sheriff's dance or the hip and jig. <laughs> so they would swing literally on these ropes until they choked to death. They oh. suffocated and died on the ropes. Man. That, that's part one. The next thing, they used them basically as fodder, if you will, to warn other pirates. They would literally wrap their bodies in chains or in some cases, put them in what was called a gibbet, which is a metal cage. Some people refer to them as Iron Maidens. In other words, you, they would stuff them in there and then paint them down with tar. 
so they could keep them on display longer. Oh, and man. literally, we just leave them strung up down through there so everybody could see them. And then after being left there for many days, as they put it to be sun-dried, they would take them down, and they would wait for low tide. And then they would drag them all the way to the edge of the water at low tide. A lot of people claim this ties into old Freemasonry stuff mm. and admiralty laws. They would drag them to the edge of the water, leave them face down in the mud, and then leave them. What was left of them, what the decayed body, they'd leave them. Eventually, the tide comes in, sweeps over them, and the fish and crabs would finish them off. Mm. And there they, they was people who used to talk of walking down through those parts of town weeks after pirate executions and literally see remnants of bleached out bones sticking out of the mud. Well, this was their version of an after school special. You know, they didn't have uh, they didn't have TV <laughs> well, shows yeah. to teach kids the right thing to do. So you'd watch a tarred body get dragged down to the ocean. That's uh, yeah, don't yeah. don't become a pirate, yeah. kids, because this yeah. could happen yeah. to you. Yeah, exactly. Um, they would usually give them an opportunity for one last statement, and some of them had repentance statements, and others just spit and said, we don't have anything to say, and then they just yanked the wagon. And it was that simple. It was that simple. Um, so for that reason, uh, the old legends are of people, in fact, I had some, a, a group last night I was doing a, uh, a pirate and ghost tour with them, and the old legend is, and it was a full moon last night over the water, that if you had walk the waterfront down through there on a full moon night as the water laps against the battery wall you can hear the cries of the pirates and see their reflected faces in the water yeah. so unfortunately the tide wasn't quite high enough for them last night but it still didn't keep a few of them from weeping before i was done but anyway i like to <laughs> you know kids at night but that that's another day another story but now, um but the tour itself focuses a lot on the real piracy came here. These guys didn't play roles in a Hollywood movie. They really showed up here. They really did this stuff. Um, the first one that the first pirates that came in, of course, were businessmen that we just had dealings with and left. We don't really know who some of these people were, but the ones who gave us trouble were very much on target with these people and know who they are. I mean, one of the ones that showed up first in, in, in August of 1717 was Steve Bonnet. Now, he was an interesting character because the man really didn't have any business being a pirate captain. Oh. He didn't really have any business being a captain of a ship because he lived on an island, the island of Barbados, on a huge plantation that grew sugar cane. This man had more money than he knew what to do with. Wow. Uh, he, he just wanted to be a pirate. So he was going through a midlife crisis. <laughs> well, some people would say so, and some people would say, yeah. He, he's going through a midlife crisis. Some people would say that, um, yeah, that you know, being a pirate back in those days would be the equivalent of getting a new tattoo and growing a ponytail and buying a Harley Davidson at the age of sixty. <laughs> but um, we don't have any tattoos, but I do have a ponytail, but I do not have a Harley Davidson. But nonetheless, <laughs> um, the real reason that most people think that he did this, and a lot of historians sort of kind of agree on this point. Apparently, his wife must have been a handful. Because it's basically said he went to pirating to get away from his <laughs> nagging wife. <laughs> well, every married man listening to this show right now is just nodding his head and getting smacked by his wife. And I uh, understand. There you go. <laughs> oh, I've had a few of them get kicked in the shin. On my, you know, <laughs> don't give me ideas from this man. But anyway, it's uh, but it is it, it is true. It's been documented that that was one of the reasons. Now, here was the thing: the guy's never been a pirate before. He's never even sailed a ship before. He, he's basically a retired major from the British Army. They had a little militia down there on the island. He was a major. He retired. But he actually paid some men to build him a ship. He didn't steal one. He paid some money to build him one. He's, he's a rich guy. He paid some money to build him a new ship. And as I tell people on the tour, it still had that nice new ship smell when he's loading cannons on it. <laughs> like a flag, he named his pirate ship Revenge. And then he took off out of Barbados under the cover of darkness in May of 1717. Now, a lot of people also talk about, there's records that indicate that within an hour after he got out of the confines of the harbor there, he was so seasick he couldn't even stand up. But apparently he finally got his sea legs under him and he showed up in the Charlestown Harbor in August of 1717. Now he grabbed a couple of ships. Now here was the other thing. 
because of the rice business, the rice plantations were exploding around here and people were making literal fortunes in the rice business. Now, um, because of that, a lot of people moved here from Barbados to be on rice plantations, to, to grow rice, because the people were making all this money. So there was tons of people living here who knew who Steve Bonnet obviously was, because it, Barbados sat in a very big island. So all these people knew who he was. He didn't want to just turn these ships loose after he cleaned them out. And they sailed right into town and say, well, you're old, our old buddy Steve Bonnet's right out there on the pirate ship. Of course, that would not have worked well. So he left with the ships. He took them with him up to the Cape Fear River. Now, you're talking about Myrtle Beach. That's about 50, 60 miles above Myrtle Beach mm-hmm. near Wilmington, North Carolina. They go in the river. He, he took everybody off the big ship and put them on the little ship. He kept the bigger ship. Most people agree that he kept it to, you know, for all intents and purposes, cannibalize that ship for lumber, mm-hmm. for his own ship. And so he put them all on this little ship and turned them loose. Now, he knew it would only take them two or three days to get back down to Charlestown, so he sold all their sails but one. So instead of a couple, three days, it took them four weeks to get back down here. Well, of course, by then, he was long gone. Right. And then he ends up getting attacked by a Spanish battleship, or actually he engaged them first, and only to find out it was a Spanish battleship, which was not a very good choice for him. And, it, and the ship was really damaged, and they, but they escaped and made it down to the Bahamas. And when they get to the Bahamas, down to Nassau, and get the ship repaired, that's when he encounters our friend Edward Beard, okay. a.k.a. Blackbeard. Ah. And that's where they get connected. Oh. And they, they form an agreement that, that Blackbeard will sail his ship he put another man named Richards in charge of his little sloop. And so Blackbeard's putting together a fleet of ships in order to be able to pillage and plunder more effectively because he's trying to get a bunch of stuff together to take back home with him, which at this point for him is in Carolina. Now, um, is it okay to plug a book on this show? Well, I don't yeah, want to. Of course. Okay, great. Well, let me plug a book for you. Let me plug a book for a buddy of mine. It lives up in North Carolina. His name is Kevin Duffus. This guy has a book called The Last Days of Blackbeard the Pirate. He's in his like third edition now. And he's even got some new chapters he's putting in the next edition that's coming up. But bottom line, this man is a walking, talking encyclopedia of Blackbeard. And he came up with two startling revelations about Blackbeard. He really has some pretty strong ties to Charleston. Hmm. Number one is real name. I called him Edward Beard. A lot of people you're going to talk to will say his name is Edward Teach, Edward Batch, Edward Drummond, Edward Thatcher. His father was James Beard, according to Kevin's research. And I've seen a lot of his research, and it's hard to argue with it. Mm. But here was the thing. James and his wife, Elizabeth, were living just up the Cooper River, not too far from Charleston, in an area we call Goose Creek, South Carolina. That's where the little town of Goose Creek is today. They were living on a farm up there when they had their little boy, Edward, around 1690. Mm -hmm. So basically what his research shows is that Blackbeard was born right there in South Carolina, just a few miles from Charleston. Yeah. One of the most notorious pirates, the Ruthless, they say. What's that? They said uh, Blackbeard was one of the most ruthless pirates to ever sell. But Eric, I tell you, we're running out of time. Can we hear just a couple of the ghost stories about, uh, you know, Captain Edward Teach, Blackbeard? And I know there's another one where a headless ghost roams the beach guarding his treasure. Oh, oh. absolutely. Absolutely. Well, there's no real ghost of Blackbeard around here, as far as we know, because he was killed in North Carolina on, on his ship. Actually, he was killed on a, uh, a ship out of Virginia that he ambushed uh, called Jane. Well, and give- that was in... Give us and a so week. His, give us a weekend down there. We'll have everybody thinking there's a ghost in Blackbeard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, but there, there are a couple of my favorite pirate, if you will, ghost stories. One of my favorites. Um, recently, there was some people um, walking down in that second town where we used to hang people. Where they used to hang these pirates, and they were just having a quiet, romantic walk down through there one evening and encountered something they weren't really expecting. They came across a guy hanging about three feet off the ground with his head in the noose. 
Mm. Immediately, they're scared half to death. There's a man down here who has hanged himself along the battery. So immediately, they're trying to call 911 to get somebody down there. They're, and they're phoning with cell phones. But then in the middle of all of this, they realize something. This guy they're staring at, hanging from a rope, is wearing knee bridges and panty loons and no shoes, a ragged shirt and a waistcoat, mm. a.k.a. A typical pirate garb. The noose is around his neck. The rope goes above his head only about a foot or so, and it, it's not attached to anything. Oh, wow. Hanging there, suspended in midair. Well, they had a hard time happens. explaining that one to the 911 <laughs> operator. Yeah. But my other favorite story, and there's a, there's a house on Meeting Street that is said to have a, a ghost in and about the house. And it's the ghost of a pirate. Now, this is what the story, how the story goes. There was, some, there was a pirate ship in the harbor, and I mentioned earlier about Van Horse Creek. Mm-hmm. This, these, these guys came up Van Horse Creek on the outside of the wall and buried a treasure somewhere in the marsh around that area on, on Meeting Street because the Water Street intersects with Meeting Street. Well, they go back to the ship. They're having a good time. Well, the captain's missing somebody. He keep, he's, he's kind of doing a head count. And there's, there's a guy missing. And he gets suspicious. He gets in his longboat, and they go back over to where the treasure was buried. Hmm. And they allegedly find this man trying to dig it up. Well, let's just say he dispatched the man on the spot. <laughs> Some people say he cut his head off. Some people say he just ran him through with a cutlass. Who knows? I wasn't there. But he had supposedly dispatched the man right there on the spot and left his body to guard the treasure. And to this day, people have claimed to have seen this misty figure of a pirate hanging around that area, that house there on Meeting Street. In fact, there was one guy who, who was quoted. He bought the house. And he said it was one of the happiest days of his life when he bought this house. This is back in, the, I believe, the 1980s. He bought the house, and he was thrilled to death, and he said the happiest day of his life was the day he bought it. The second happiest day of his life was a year later when he sold it because he encountered that ghost 23 times in a year (laughs) and said, I'm getting out of this place. I want nothing else to do with it, and he couldn't wait to get out of there. So, um, So we do walk down some pretty dark alleys on the tour at night, especially. We walk through some alleys in the daylight, too, but... Uh, at night, we do go through some pretty uh, interesting little alleyways that have said to have had pirates walking through them, even as far back as the uh, the seventeen fifty. I mean, the seventeen fifteen era. Now, a lot of those, a lot of a lot of those houses, Eric, those are vintage uh, pirate era, right? Some of them. Oh yeah, there is one particular house that's located on Chalmers Street. We all refer to it around here as the Pink House mm-hmm. because it's pink. Now, the house has always been pink. It's painted pink now, but it's always been pink because the house was originally constructed from Bermuda limestone coral. Now, if you ever go to Bermuda and walk the beaches of Bermuda, people talk about the pink sand. Well, that's what the coral's made of. I mean, that's that's just broken down coral. That was a great building material because once all that water leached out of these stones, they're just, I mean, it made great building material. It was said to have been a tavern and a brothel for several years. In fact, some people claim anywhere between 150 and 200 years after it was completed. And it was a water and hole for pirates. You'd have probably seen pirates running in and out of this place, and, you know, back in the day. And uh, as I tell people on the tour, I'm sure there was probably more than one pirate felt his last warm embrace on the face of the earth in that building before losing his life at sea. But, um, but, yeah, that house still stands. It's actually on the market. So if anybody wants to buy it, it's uh, sitting right there on Chalmers Street if anybody wants to uh, pick up a little Charleston souvenir. For I bet that's only hey, 80000 John, 000. I know you, I've often started a brothel, so, I mean, there you go. It's, uh, <laughs> I bet that's yeah. only a swinging $80,000 house, too, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, well, it's, it's a little more than that. Yeah, <laughs> I bet. Yeah, I think uh, it's 900 over. It's $900,000 for the house. Hey, Eric, we got to close out, brother. Uh, your website, could you get that out for people could find out more about you?
Oh, did we lose Eric? Yeah, uh, website for our tours. Hold, hold on one second. We're get. We hey, got Sean, you. Are we we back got, up. We got you. We got you. Clear. Okay. Yeah, we wanted to get okay. you. We wanted to get your website out there, Eric. Oh sure, absolutely. It's a uh, Charleston Pirate Tour. T O U R Charleston Pirate Tour dot com. And they can go on our website. There's all kind of pictures. Uh, there's links on there to a lot of different pirate information if people are seeking pirate information because. Um, believe it or not, there's probably a whole lot more pirate history here than people would imagine. I mean, even only up into the 1720s, we had we had problems with pirates showing up here, and so it was a Charleston uh, doesn't take a backseat to anywhere else that I'm aware of anywhere on the East Coast to its pirate history. Um, it just other people pale in comparison to what all happened here. Because, I mean, a lot of pirates may have made ports of call in a few places, but we had pirates born and lived here. I mean, the most notorious female pirate was raised here until she sneaked out of town with her uh, pirate husband. <laughs> and who was that? So that would have been Miss Ann Bonnie. Ah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, she grew up on a plantation up the Cooper River, and, uh, and she uh, married a guy named her name was Ann Cormack. She married a man named James Bonney, and who was dabbled in piracy. Dad wasn't thrilled at their nuptials, so he basically disinherited her and threw her out of the house. Well, her reaction to that was to go back in and hit her dad in the head with an axe handle and set the house on fire. So um, That's effective. And effective. they ended up in the Bahamas. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Well, so, yeah, we talk about that on the... Uh, we, we talk about that on there, too. Well, I'll tell you what. We go into great detail about it. And I actually have a, a copy of the transcript of their trial. Oh, wow. Her, her sidekick, yeah. who was Mary Reed, who was also another female pirate. And she didn't live here. They they met up with each other down in the Caribbean. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well exactly. Eric, about that on there as well. I think Sean has to wrap up for the night. Would you stay on the line for just a moment so that uh, he can wrap up? And uh, if you'd stay on, we'd love to talk to you for a minute after the show. Absolutely. Whatever you need, guys. Happy to accommodate. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, you've Eric. Been, you've been amazing. You've been amazing. A lot of, getting a lot of feedback a lot of, here on my ear. All right, buddy. Uh, hey, guys. Charles hey guys, is tired to her. To check her, it out. Get it out. we got to close out. Close out. Oh, you're cutting in and out pretty yeah. bad. I can't hear what you're saying. All right, guys. Special thanks to Planet Paranormal, Stitcher, Smart Radio, Creative Commons. Thanks for the tunes. The band tonight. The band tonight, which was the Bomb Blasters. Check them out at creativecommons.com. Susan G. Coleman, three-day supporter. We are, you are. Make sure you go to our website, ghostanddemon.com. Help us fight cancer. Creations by Souls Denounced. That's soulsdenounced.com. Midnight Syndicate, thanks for the tunes. Hey, from the haunted back roads of America, this has been another GD exclusive interview. Don't go change in America. You know we won't. Demon Hunter, because we love you. Night, guys. Yeah.